Zoffman Show on the Team 980, always live as well on the free Odyssey app, streaming live on YouTube, youtube.com slash at the Team 980, the on-demand content at Craig Hoffman, where you can watch our weekly interview with Clinton Yates, who joins us now. Yates, I think by the end of the weekend, with this training camp content, we could be over 3,000 YouTube subscribers, and I'm pretty pumped about it. That's pretty amazing, and I'm glad you brought that up because that gets to exactly what I wanted to discuss. And I was thinking about this yesterday, and mm-hmm. somebody tagged me in a Twitter post and said, Ash Bernistan is no longer. And I thought about that because those of you who know, back when I wrote for the Washington Post, I coined that term as this way to describe everything that was such a disaster at the headquarters based on the regime of Dan Snyder. And, you know, I will say this with confidence – I'm okay with retiring that term. The goal was met. The Death Star has been exploded as far as I'm concerned. And quite frankly, I am enjoying, just as a former resident and a native, seeing people happy. You know, like the price of admission to polite society was worth the fight, I think, for this fan base. And so for all these people who are like, oh, yeah, well, don't get so high on your horse, Burgundy and Gold fans. They're not going to be that good. Vegas only has them at six or seven wins. Okay, but there's really no way, and I don't really know, quite frankly, on sort of a larger level, if any fan base currently in America that is living and breathing can relate to what Commanders fans are dealing with and are experiencing. There's just not... An akin situation. Now, we talked about the Browns last week in terms of the team leaving and the team coming back. That's a little different because not everybody sat around and crapped on the Browns forever outside of, you know, whatever, because the team wasn't even there. This is such a unique circumstance in the American sports world, Craig, that I'm fascinated to watch just just how it develops plainly because, you know, I'll get off my high horse here, but there is no precedent to erasing the slate and having a clean table of things where you can't just kind of blame everybody that used to be there. That was a big part of the discourse around this team for a long time was same old thing, same old thing, same old thing. Well, there's a new thing. You got a new house. You got a new car. Can't blame it on the old transmission. Can't blame it on the old housekeeper. And don't want to either. It's just a very interesting experience that I'm fascinated to watch going forward. All right, multiple things to uh, unpack here. One, I think you are correct that there's no other fan base that's similar. Like there, you could piece together uh, the shame pieces, the bad performance pieces, the you know whatever piece the Browns are. Um, yeah. the, the, it feels like the team was taken away piece because like the Clippers, for instance. I was on. Uh, I was did a podcast last night uh, with Danny Parkins. He does a, okay. a big national NFL pod, and he, was, he made the, the comparison to the Clippers, where it's like. He's like, I don't remember when Donald Sterling got voted out a pep rally like what we had last week, (laughs) right? And it's like, well, you know, the Clippers weren't good. There was nothing to be proud of before. So there there was no return to glory because there was no glory. Um, And by the way, the history of that franchise before Sterling, I don't even think they were in L.A. that long. So um, very, very, very different. Um, And Buffalo before that. So very, very different um, circumstances there. The closest world stage thing I can think of is Manchester United, um, but like where where they were glory, you know, what best team in the league, arguably one of the biggest fan bases in the league. Certainly, you know, when you expand out beyond the league and look at right. their global impact, one of the biggest in the world. They get bought out by American owners of all people, and they have not been nearly as good since. But and there has been like some shame and scandal, uh, the flirtation with the Super League and all that kind of stuff, yeah. but, like. There's no congressional investigate like that. The thing that separates this one, I think, compared to everything else is not only is the team mediocre and bad and does it feel like it's stolen and mismanaged, but you then also have the literal criminal behavior that goes on to it. And to me, like that is the heart of what you meant by Ash Burnistan. Like there is, you know, literally criminally bad behavior. And you you always had a very nice, concise way of explaining the term. I don't want to butcher it. So what was the 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 saying uh, that you Uh, used? proud nation ruined by the greed and avarice of small men yes <laughs> and that's gone and I, I agree with you that it's gone but i it, journalism hat on like why why are you confident that a week and a day into this that you can like yep we're good we're ash Burnistan is done you know i think it's because mainly 
there's just sort of a time for something to end. I mean, that term in my mind's eye was very much about Dan Snyder. It was very much about what happened. And I would almost even, I'm not going to extend it to Jack Ken Cook, but I've said this before. That guy was not some saint either. You know what I mean? Which is half the reason why, getting to my next point, the team isn't even in the district anymore. You can look that story up on your own if you want to know how he dealt with that with Sharon Pratt, the mayor at the time. I, I just feel that, Josh, at the very least, as in Harris and Magic, should be given their own sort of thing. And if it fails miserably with them, that's one thing. But that is legitimately a separate regime. But that does get me to my next point that I wanted to ask you about, which is there's a story I read in the Washington Post two days ago about how D.C. might be getting control back of the RFK site, which brings a whole host of other discussions because there is this notion that the rightful place and the most sensible place for the football team to play is at RFK Stadium. And yeah, there is a nostalgic element. I've seen football games in that stadium en masse. But I do think there is a real discussion to be had about whether or not that actually makes the most sense beyond the fairy tale notion in our minds of what that used to be. The district has changed a lot. The NFL has changed a lot. Obviously, that franchise has changed a lot. And on some levels, the fan base has changed a lot. I'm not necessarily sure that that makes the most sense, even for the city to do for, let's just say, 10 games a year, presuming they don't make the playoffs every year. And so I'm very interested, again, just from a sort of news development standpoint, Craig, what happens at each stage of the game? Because there's no precedent for this in terms of the NFL in any particular city. So I'm glad you brought that up, and I want to flip this right back around at you because you did grow up here, lived here, and yeah. not only that, like you covered the city before you got to the sports section at the Post. Like you did coverage of Washington D.C. and local issues um, like this. And my my kind of take on this at this point is I have yet to see a better plan for that area than a mixed use site. Meaning right. it's not all just going to be a stadium and then everything else is blocked off. It is the stadium is the center of a shopping and living region that becomes a, the new neighborhood in D.C. And could you build that without a football stadium and have some people move to that part of town? Sure. But is that actually a better use than if people were coming down there not just for 10 football games a year but for potentially soccer games of you know the local right. variety um if, if you wanted to play some uh, that are at audi I, one proposal that i've heard behind the scenes is that for instance they would do a stadium and practice facility down there and the practice facility would be more reminiscent of what they have in frisco for the Cowboys, where it's actually sure. a 10,000 seat stadium, and maybe the Washington Spirit play there. And so you yep. now have two pro teams that are using the facility, and you have high school football that can be played there. And in the big stadium, you have concerts and you have all the things that are at FedEx Field now and at every other stadium in the country. Um, the arena tours, uh, you know, the potential, obviously, when you build a new NFL stadium, you get a Super Bowl. Um, sure. The Olympics uh, could, could certainly be in play at some point in the future. And I, I guess, like, the question I would have is, you know, you've got people on city council saying there's, like, we have all this data that says stadiums are not the best use of public funds. And I agree with that. But if public funds could go to revitalizing the infrastructure, widening some of the roads and in that area to make the, to use the Josh Harris term, ingress and egress, the ins and outs of the stadium <laughs> better when on game days. And it could revitalize the Metro in that part of town and make that stadium uh, the, or that, that Metro stop at the stadium much, much easier to flow people in and out on a game day or a concert day or on event day. Like that's where the public money should go. The yeah. rich guys who just bought the team pay for the actual stadium. And to me, that actually is a really good use of everybody's money. And it puts it in a central location and all the other benefits spiritually and, and logistically of RFK. Here, here's the thing about that is that I actually feel as somebody that also used to live near there that that area is almost a little too, how do I explain this? It's only ever really seen a stadium in anybody's lifetimes. And I don't mean that a stadium would not be a good idea there, but that's actually decent view property. There, Sorry, there are better things you could do that did not include a stadium that could also revitalize. And I don't think those things are in opposition, but I would probably do something like this. Audi Field's footprint, 
I believe, is what should be at a site like that. You want to build a big stadium? Well, build it at Audi Field. Build it at Buzzard Point. Build it at a place where everybody can get in and get in and get out, but you don't have this sort of monstrosity taking over what is otherwise also just a place that people might want to live because of its access to a lot of things, not just because people want to come there for football. It is, in fact, extremely complicated. Back in the day, a council member named Vincent Orange had this whole plan to build movie sets there and make it sound stages and all this kind of stuff, which, you know, at, at, at that point, what's the difference between that and an NFL stadium if we're thinking about large buildings that are going to try to bring in a lot of stuff? This was 15 years ago. But I, I do think that that is going to become something that is a real issue for Harris in terms of where, who are you serving? Because the people in that area that could probably use – that sort of revitalization are also probably the people who are going to be displaced if all of this stuff happens. And then you've got an entirely separate circumstance in terms of the residents that are being availed of whatever this development is. That's a separate problem that we deal with with gentrification in D.C., which is that everybody wants to build something up, but then once it gets built up, nobody who was already there gets to come back, i.e. the way Navy Yard looks now. And sure, right. Navy Yard is great, but there was a time when people actually lived there and none of those people have been allowed to return. And so there's thoughts of maybe you just let folks live in terms of that and sort of, you want to build a stadium, build a stadium. Build it wherever you want, but you don't have to force it down the folks' throats at RFK because it's not like necessarily everybody loved that anyway, if we're being quite honest. The idea of your, your neighborhood getting taken over for eight weekends a year at minimum. Yeah, Clint Yates with us here on the Hoffman Show. And that's, that's the struggle, right? Is like, I think a lot of people look at Navy Yard and go, well, Nats Park is the model. It's such a success. Look at all the everything. And then you kind of, peel back the curtain and whoa that's a lot of ugly gentrification that's happening right. underneath there and i say that knowing like the building that we work out of is one of those buildings like Correct. it is what it is um the thing that i think is interesting about the rfk site though is i think it's 190 acres yeah there's nobody currently living there there's people in the neighborhood surrounding no. it but the actual federal land like th this is kind of my thing clinton is like if there was such a great idea that could have been executed they haven't been using that stadium at all since 2018 for no, football okay, hold on. Let me let me 19, let me rewind. Whatever. Knock the damn stadium down. But you right. might as well make it a national park. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm saying. Which is like, one of the things that they, people right. are saying. There you are know, let's make it a green space. Plenty other things you can do that have nothing to do with the stadium that to me would have equal value, but probably aren't going to happen because this idea of the stadium being there in our lifetimes is all that we know. You see what I'm saying? And so, like, mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with building a stadium in D.C. I just don't actually know that RFK is the place for it. Again, where Audi Field is is, in fact, a perfect place for a football stadium. If we're thinking about how people get there, if you're talking about coming from Virginia or Maryland, that's my personal opinion. Without gumming up a lot of the rest of the city that otherwise would not have that kind of traffic flow, if we really want to get into the distribution of public, um, public transportation on that particular side of town. But I kind of feel like I want to see RFK without a stadium just for what it may be to the city. You know what I mean? And that that's that's personal. I don't live there anymore. I'm not acting as if this is some sort of um, constituent complaint. But I, I think that that's going to be much trickier now that the demographics of the district have changed than I think people are giving it credit for as standard residents. The assumption is, of course, everybody wants it back at RFK. But once you get that wheel going and once that actually gets into play, in place, I'm not so sure that's going to be that easy. Yeah, the the DC United Audi Field angle of it is interesting. Uh, Mayor Bowser was actually on with the junkies this morning, and they oh, really? talked about Poplar Point, and she said yep. that's not an ideal place, which I thought was interesting because that's you know opposite of the exact place you're talking about. It's just the other side of the bridge, and that would seem uh, rather ideal. Yeah, I mean, I, again, political interests. She's the mayor. I know Muriel, but, you know, again, what the mayor thinks is ideal is not necessarily what residents is going to think is ideal, which is not necessarily what the fan base is going to think is ideal, which certainly is not necessarily what the ownership group is going to think is ideal. You got a guy from Bethesda dealing with a fan base that's largely from Virginia, if we're being honest, dealing mm -hmm. with, you know, a mayor of D.C. This is where things get hairy. Well, this is the other dynamic that's changed, too. And, you know, I think most people listening probably understand this, but like, I think there's a real fear of putting it in Virginia from the team because you've got the Ravens now. And like, yes, there's 
clearly going to be a lot of generational fans that stick with the burgundy and gold, but you've also already lost so many fans the last 20 years and the Ravens have been good and you've got the proximity in Maryland. And it's like, well, Hey, if the team is, you know, yeah, sure. We're a DC suburb and we're, we root for the Nats and the wizards and uh, the caps, but Baltimore is just as close to me as Loudoun County. So why would I root for the commanders over the Ravens when the Ravens are a model NFL franchise and have been for 20 years? And I really like that Lamar Jackson guy. And I, I think that's the kind of thing that the ownership group probably is thinking about. Like how do we centralize it or maybe keep a foothold in Virginia with a practice facility and the stadium in Maryland so that we can try to keep the DMV together. It's not a bad point, but that's exactly what the price of doing business is in the NFL. Like, uh, sorry, you know what I'm saying? Like, you, you knew that when you bought the team. And I'm not saying that should disqualify you from trying to keep the team, but if it turns out in practice that the best cost-benefit analysis for the football team is to build a stadium in Virginia, you should build a stadium in Virginia and just make sure that you have a product that people like. You've already lost a generation of fans to the Ravens. I know that because my own kid brother, who's 20 years old, is a Ravens fan. You know what I'm saying? And like, I just feel that there are some concessions that you're going to have to assume because it's not like you're starting over from when Dan Snyder bought the team. You are not going back to the 90s and all of a sudden a restart you are still going to be dealing with the generational issues that were brought up as a result of again fan retention other teams in other markets that are close by as well as generalized views on what people think the value of an nfl uh venue is in their towns that that you can't put that toothpaste back into the tube and so ideally there are certain concepts that i think we would want to tackle but practically it's just not the same thing in 2023 yeah, I hadn't really considered this because I think I, I've been caught up in the RFK thing. But like, we had Siciliano on Wednesday, Wednesday I think, mm-hmm. um, and he obviously grew up here. Same thing, rest in rest in kid, uh, who now has the perspective of working at NFL Network and traveling around the country, and still is very tied here. Though most of his family's still here, et, et right. cetera, and he just goes, man. Like the RFK thing would be cool, but if they build a stadium on the moon and the product's good, people will show up. And I just hadn't heard someone say that. And, right. you know, as much as we'll take calls and people will say that that's crazy, and like if they move the team to X, then I'm out. No, you're not. Like if you've stuck with it this long through all the crap that Snyder put you through and Bruce Allen and the rest of the, the, the buffoonery that uh, yeah. got this place nicknamed Ashburnistan, which we have now retired, uh, yeah, then yeah. I don't think having to drive a little bit extra when you go to the games as if and sure there are people that might go to every game now that might start watching a lot more on television um but i think that you'll probably wind up watching on television versus going uh, yeah, and, and that will be the change versus not rooting for the team at all. Right. And and to your to your example about the Cowboys, that's also in Dallas, man. You've, you've lived in Dallas. I've been in Dallas plenty. That's just a completely different layout of life in terms of the space around everything. Stadium's in Arlington, and the facility is in Frisco. Like, th- there's just not that kind of room to operate in the same way within the similar jurisdictions in, in, in D.C. And so... Yeah, there's certain ideas you can take from certain places, but this is going to be a bespoke example because of the fact that there are three literal actual jurisdictions in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia that you're serving. This becomes an, in fact, complex problem that, you know, if they're not prepared to work together, which was kind of always the whole deal, Snyder wanted to pit everybody against each other because they were the big draw. I don't think that can be the way that you do this. I think you've got to find a way to bring together a coalition of human beings from Maryland, D.C., and Virginia as a way to make this work and serve out everybody's best interest, as opposed to just opening up the coffers and saying, well, whoever convinces me is where we're going. That doesn't strike me as smart these days. Yeah, um, and I do think it's interesting. Like Youngkin was at practice yesterday, governor of Mm -hmm. Virginia, and he's in office for a couple more years, so he will be the one ultimately deciding from the executive level in Virginia Right. Uh, Wes Moore, who just took office recently, like he's been very vocal that he wants the team to stay in PG County. And then obviously Bowser this morning on the Junkies and other places she's spoken, like they all want the team. Suddenly, uh, <laughs> Josh Harris, hey man, yeah. open for business. Um, yeah, you know, they all want to visit for Magic Johnson. Who wouldn't? Right. Uh, and so very true. We'll see. We'll see where that goes. Clint Yates with us here on the Hoffman Show again. The major breaking news: Ashburnistan has officially been retired. <laughs> That's a term. Uh, real quick, though, on the way out, uh, yeah. I know you've spent most of your week out there in L.A. following this story. Shohei Otani is going to stay with the Angels. And after you see how he pitched uh, the other day, one-hit shutout in late July, 
who does that. Uh, <laughs> it, why would you ever trade that guy? Uh, well, he's going to be a free agent, but like, I mean, what do you make of the decision? And, and ultimately, what does the offseason look like for him? It was a two-parter for me. Number one was the fact that the way that they stated that he was going to be staying was by claiming that he was off the trade market, whilst never having claimed he was technically on the trade market, as in we didn't see any of those offers. We didn't even hear any leaked. As you know, typically in these kind of negotiations, one team will say, oh, yeah, well, you know, this is what we offer just to kind of assuage their fan base to let them know they gave it a shot. Or even the team with the player will say, oh, look at that craptastic thing that they offered. How dare they? You know what I'm saying? As a way to sort of gain some ground in the negotiations. None of that happened. It was just, oh, no, he's staying. He's off the trademark. And I was like, oh, okay. That was actually quite refreshing to me from an Angels team that said, yeah, he's Shohei Otani. Of course we're going to stick with him. We've got an outside shot at the playoffs. Matter of fact, we bring in some more people in, you know what I'm saying, so we can actually make a run. And I think ultimately that was the most prudent decision for R.D. Moreno because there's this notion of, oh, you can't just let him walk for nothing. It's not for nothing. He's on the team. He's playing in front of a crowd <laughs> that enjoys watching him play, and he does it well. There's no for nothing in that scenario. And that game yesterday, man, bro, so I'm sitting around the apartment. I turn on the game. 10 o'clock start out here. I'm thinking, all right, Shohei's throwing against the Tigers. No big deal. Get to the third or fourth. I'm doing some things around the house. He's still on the mound. Tigers still have no runs, and the Halos do. Gets to the fourth, gets to the fifth and sixth. He's still on the mound. Tigers still have no runs. He gets to the seventh, and I'm like, what is he still doing here? You know what I'm saying? Like, I said, let me just watch this. And then I was like, wow, he legitimately just threw a complete game. And just on well, my basic memory, I was like, I don't think I've ever seen him do that before. It was his first one ever. And so one hits them on the road, turns around as a DH, hits two bombs out of the park. And then they say, yeah, he's on day-to-day with some muscle tightness. Uh, you don't say. You don't say uh-huh. that a guy who hit two homers and threw a one-hitter is a little tight in the muscles after that. It's just you, there's nothing to say, Craig. The performances you're seeing out of him are something that we've never seen before in Major League Baseball. And I'm glad that the – the, the Angels fans who committed to this for six seasons finally get, to, finally get the payoff throughout the end of the year. Is there any chance he stays, though? I think the best chance that he stays is pretty simple. If they go to the playoffs and they make a little bit of a run, you know, and that's entirely possible. It's not. Listen, the Phillies last year were the last team in the playoffs and went to the World Series. If something like that happens, I could very much see a world in which he stays because, hello, Competition matters, man. People just assume that, oh, well, he would want to go to the Dodgers because they're the most winningest franchise year to year or, you know, the Yankees or whatever. And I'm like, how about the team that wins most recently is most likely the better team? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's something to keep in mind you know, sure. when you're thinking about where guys want to go, especially guys that aren't Americans, that don't have this long-filtered notion of greatness through whatever concepts of the franchises that we believe because we grew up watching them in a different kind of way than other people did. I just hope that he makes a choice that ultimately makes him happy to play baseball because his sort of joie de vivre when he's on the field is the fun part beyond the skill. Everybody likes him. And to see him go to a team where it became only about winning or only about what he was doing in order to sort of, you know, get a team back to what their, what their level was supposed to be. I don't actually care about that. The Shohei Otani show is enough in itself, in my personal opinion, to entertain me for the rest of his career. Yeah, he's also going to care about the check. So we'll yeah. see who offers <laughs> the, the biggest check that, that, uh, that tends to be influential. No matter where someone is from, what how much they care about winning, the money money talks. All right, talks. Uh, Clint Yates on Around the Horn uh, weekly on ESPN. You can also read his work at ESPN.com and Anscape. Uh, and if you want more Otani talk, ESPN LA, uh, you can catch him there as well. And, and then you can catch him next Friday here on the Hoffman Show because that's what yeah, we do. Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, Gregory, have a great weekend, sir. You too. Thanks, buddy. See ya. Hey, this is DA, and you're listening to The Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.